Winston Churchill guided Britain in alliance with the United States and the Soviet Union to victory in World War II, but was at once repudiated by the electorate as the war came to an end. To much of Britain, he represented the wrong kind of conservatism, backward-looking, elitist, dedicated to class distinctions and to the empire. His successor as Prime Minister, the Labour leader Clement Attlee, nationalised the major parts of the British economy and began to dissolve the empire. Churchill supervised the recovery of the Conservative Party from this debacle and returned it to power in 1951. He and his successors, Anthony Eden, Harold Macmillan and Alec Douglas Hume, found, however, that they would not be able to reverse most of the Attlee revolution of the foregoing years. They too accepted the new National Health Service, the nationalised higher educational system and the nationalised coal, steel, railways and shipbuilding industries. Eden's inability to complete the Suez campaign in the face of President Eisenhower's disapproval in 1956 demonstrated once and for all that Britain was no longer a world power. Despite these chastening encounters with decline, however, the Conservatives continued to believe in capitalism and to deplore escalating rates of taxation, over-mighty trade unions and the continued erosion of Britain's competitive position in the world. Their fortunes appeared to be at a low ebb in 1965 when they had just lost another election and when the 91-year-old Churchill died. Well, Churchill led a coalition wartime government, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, but then at the end of the war he lost the general election of 1945 to the Labour Party leader, Clement Attlee. Churchill had always been a warrior and was always fascinated by every aspect of war itself. So during the wartime years, 1940 to 45, while he was Prime Minister, he dedicated himself almost entirely to questions of foreign policy and the actual conduct of the war. He irked his generals by constantly intervening in their decision making. This was completely dissimilar to President Franklin Roosevelt, who wasn't particularly interested in military affairs and who left it to the Joint Chiefs of Staff and to trusted generals like George Marshall and Dwight Eisenhower. It's possible to get a sense of what uh, wartime government in Britain must have been like because it's now possible to visit the cabinet war rooms which are underneath Whitehall in the very centre of London where the government uh, acts. Uh, some um, reinforced shelters, the cabinet war rooms, were established and Churchill and the Cabinet spent a lot of time down there. They're very, very low. They've got uh, concrete roofs just about six feet off the floor, so you almost have to hunch to go in there. They're claustrophobic. Very, very spartan conditions in which the wartime government was being run. And everybody smoked in those days, including Churchill himself with, Churchill himself with his cigars. It must have been an appallingly smoky and constrained atmosphere, confined. Churchill's finest hour came during the Battle of Britain in the late summer and fall of 1940 and then during the Battle of the Atlantic in 1941 as convoys from Canada and the United States desperately tried to cross the Atlantic in the face of very, very heavy German submarine attacks. Once the United States entered the war after December of 1941, Churchill's role and the role of Britain overall dwindled steadily. Britain remained a vital part of the anti-Hitler alliance, but nevertheless, with the passage of each successive month, the American contribution to the war effort grew greater. Churchill himself, from the very moment he came to 10 Downing Street, worked tirelessly to involve the United States, because he recognised, as had Chamberlain in Halifax, that Britain alone would be unable to defeat Nazi Germany. The, the great surprise of 1940 was just how powerful Hitler really was. If you'd asked anyone in 1939 who were the world's great powers, France would certainly have been on the list. And yet when it came to the point, France was defeated in six weeks. The Germans had been unable to conquer France own four years in the First World War, and now suddenly in the matter of weeks it was swept away. That was the jarring surprise of the early years of the war. One of Churchill's early successes in trying to involve the Americans was persuading President Roosevelt to sign the Atlantic Charter. This was in August 1941, three months before Pearl Harbor. It was a, the Atlantic Charter was a pledge that the Americans would cooperate in the defeat of Nazism and in the creation of post-war collective security arrangements. <laughs> 
Roosevelt also agreed to Churchill's request for help by establishing the Lend-Lease system. Essentially, this was a policy whereby the Americans sent war materials to Britain even when it couldn't afford to pay for them. And the Destroyers for Bases deal, by which uh, the Royal Navy was sent some old American destroyers for convoy patrol in exchange for uh, giving the right of the American Navy to use bases in the British colonies in the Caribbean. But the, uh, the need for American aid remained acute. Churchill was determined, if possible, to preserve the British Empire. But his allies in the war, Roosevelt in America and Stalin in the Soviet Union, were equally determined not to let him. And even after the Americans had joined the war, Churchill had to suffer some terrible disappointments. Perhaps the most jarring of all, coming just after Pearl Harbor, was the sinking of two British battleships in the Far East in quick succession. And then the fall of Singapore, the, despite the fact that it had a large uh, British garrison which more than outnumbered the attacking Japanese force. It was a dismaying sense to Churchill that Britain was losing the warrior virtues. Singapore ought not to have capitulated so cheaply. This was in the stage immediately after Pearl Harbor when the Japanese briefly seemed absolutely invincible. Churchill left the running of domestic affairs inside Britain mainly to his deputy prime minister Clement Attlee. Attlee had also enjoyed a privileged upbringing, like Churchill, was an idealistic socialist and was a wounded veteran of World War I. Like Churchill and like many members of the, uh, the, the governments of those times, he was a wounded World War I veteran. He'd become a professor at the London School of Economics, but then moved directly into politics. Um, Churchill constantly made deprecating comments about Clement Attlee. He described him as a sheep in sheep's clothing. One time he says, an empty car drew up and Clement Attlee climbed out. When somebody said that Attlee was a modest man, Churchill retorted, he's a modest man with a great deal to be modest about. One of the important uh, reports during the war was the Beveridge Report, written by an influential liberal politician, Lord Beveridge, and outlining a comprehensive plans for a comprehensive welfare state that were to be introduced when the war was ended. And the Beveridge Report created almost millennial hopes among Britons, uh, the prospect of better times to come. The Great Depression in Britain had been very long and bitter, starting much earlier in Britain than in America, from the early 20s in many industries, particularly bad in the north of England in the coal mining and shipbuilding and iron and steel districts, and persisting right through the 1930s. There was a profound feeling in Britain of justice deferred, that sooner or later better times must come. And that wartime sacrifices, and particularly the fact that many parts of industrial Britain were very heavily bombed by the German Air Force, made further denial or further delay intolerable. There was intense fear in Britain of the return of high rates of unemployment and the return of what were looked at by labouring people as uncaring conservative governments when the war ended. And the armed forces became a kind of vast training ground in socialist ideas. My own father, who was in the Royal Air Force, recalls that uh, during the long, long waiting periods, which always attend life in the military services, uh, the soldiers were, and, the, and the airmen were constantly exchanging ideas and learning about socialism, sometimes in a highly idealistic way, and were resenting being pushed around by officers from the upper social classes. As soon as the war against Hitler ended, the wartime coalition government broke up, and in the ensuing election, Attlee defeated Churchill. Churchill campaigned in that, in that election in 1945 on preserving the empire, and he declared that the prospective welfare state outlined in the Beveridge Report was simply too expensive and would lead to a kind of repressive socialist centralisation. Although it's interesting to note that even the Conservative manifesto did promise a national health service Everybody in British political life had been shocked by the low levels of general health disclosed by the draft, the military draft. Huge numbers of people in Britain in those days never went to a doctor at any time in their lives. Tens of thousands had simple correctable medical problems which had never been corrected for lack of a visit either to a doctor or an optometrist or a dentist. Well, Attlee's victory in 1945 gave the Labour Party its first overall parliamentary majority. And between 1945 and 1950, Labour set about nationalising the, what it called the commanding heights of the economy. Transport, the railroads, medicine, the iron and steel industry, the coal industry, higher education, or, and many other major industries. 
despite conservative protests about the cost of nationalisation and about the viability of doing so. These years immediately following the Second World War were extremely grim in Britain. R food rationing remained very high, not just during the fighting years, but far through the late 40s and into the early 1950s. Tax rates were very high, and there was increasingly uh, very uh, restrained opportunities for individual initiative. The winter of 1947 was very, very severe, and Britons who lived then still remember the feeling of misery and austerity which went with it. The Conservatives' Industrial Charter was written in 1947 by a, an up-and-coming Conservative poli poli a parliamentarian called R.A. Butler. And it said, among other things, this is the Conservative response to nationalisation. Man cannot live by economics alone. We are completely opposed to the imposition of a rigid straitjacket of doctrinaire political theory, either upon the individual, regardless of his individuality, or upon the nation, regardless of the economic facts of the moment. Our abiding objective is to free industry from unnecessary controls and restrictions. We wish to substitute for the present paralysis, in which we are experiencing the worst of all worlds, a system of free enterprise, which is on terms with authority and which reconciles the need for central direction with the encouragement of individual effort. In other words, let's free up the economy and get back to a system of free enterprise which the socialists are now trying to prevent. It added that the socialists, the Labour Party, had completely failed to come to terms with human nature. Quoting again now, a man asks himself, what is the good of working harder if he is not to receive a just reward for his extra toil or ingenuity? Here, the socialists have carried their passion for equality to lengths which have stifled man's will to do the best of which he is capable. We are determined to restore, by all reasonable means, that great stimulus to personal endeavour, fair incentive. It's always been central to conservative, uh, the conservative philosophy that people differ, their interests different, differ, and their willingness to work hard differ. And therefore, the system ought to reflect those, those differences. This was also the period of the beginning of the breakup of the British Empire. Britain gave independence to India and Israel, much to Churchill's dismay in both cases. Lord Louis Mountbatten, the Queen's cousin, was sent as the last viceroy to India. Although he was royal, he was a, a dabbler in radical ideas. Now, in the very, very volatile politics of pre-independence India, he openly favoured Nehru and the Congress Party. This is the Hindu majority. He antagonised Jinnah, the leader of the big Muslim minority, and made the creation of a separate Pakistan almost inevitable. The very short time span set by the Labour government also made partition inevitable, and that in turn set off the hideous massacres of Hindus and Muslims as each population tried to cross over to the area in which their religious group would be in a, a majority. Churchill, meanwhile, as leader of the opposition, dedicated himself to shoring up the Anglo-American alliance against the Soviet threat. As a guest of President Truman at Fulton, Missouri, he coined one of the famous phrases of the era, and in a well-remembered speech he said, From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across Europe. That was the first use of the term iron curtain, but it came to symbolise the division across Europe. Very, very quickly after the end of hostilities, the British and the Americans had both had a, a feeling of betrayal by the Soviet Union, which refused to demilitarise Poland and Eastern Germany and uh, Austria and Hungary, the places it had liberated from the Nazi armies, and instead had imposed its own puppet regimes there. Churchill added that the experience of the 1930s had showed the falsehood of appeasement. Quote, I am convinced that there is nothing they, the Soviets, admire so much as strength and there is nothing for which they have less respect than for weakness, especially military weakness. When they returned to power in 1951, the Conservatives had to decide how to react to these profound changes in British life and equally profound changes in Britain's place in the world. The Attlee government was re-elected in 1950, but with a shrunken majority and deep splits within the Labour Party, especially over the why economic recovery was so slow over the fact that there was continued rationing and over whether the welfare state was affordable. In the end, a division within the Labour Party defeated the government and forced a 1951 election, 
the rejuvenated Conservative Party won, having taken in most of the remaining old Liberals. The Liberal Party had struggled on from the 1920s into the late 40s, but by now it was almost extinct as a viable political force. Here's one of Churchill's election speeches in 1951. The British race have always abhorred arbitrary and absolute government in every form. The socialist conception of the all-powerful state entering into the smallest detail of the life and conduct of the individual and claiming to plan and shape his work and its rewards is odious and repellent to every friend of freedom. These absolute powers would make the group of politicians who obtained a majority of seats in Parliament the masters, not the servants, of the people and centralise all government in Whitehall. Similarly, Churchill's colleague Harold Macmillan recognised that Labour was campaigning against a return to the bad old days of high unemployment. Macmillan said, The socialists have fought the election very astutely, not on socialism, but on fear. Fear of unemployment, fear of reduced wages, fear of reduced social benefits, fear of war. These four fears have been brilliantly, if unscrupulously, exploited. If before the next election none of these fears has proved reasonable, we may be able to force the opposition to fight on socialism. Then we can win. In other words, Macmillan's perception is most of the British people don't actually like socialism. They simply voted for it in 1945 as a way of not returning to the bad old days of prolonged depression. Well, Churchill's government in 51 was the first purely conservative government since Stanley Baldwin back in the 1920s, 24 to 9. Because, dur because during the 1930s and 40s, the conditions of depression and war, there had been a succession of coalition governments. There had been vast changes in Britain's, British life and in Britain's position in the world in the meantime. What did conservatism mean now? In particular, should the Conservative Party back in office roll back the transformations of the last few years, or should it try to live with them and domesticate them? Well, the Conservatives very quickly discovered that the nationalised health and the nationalised higher education systems were too popular to discard. And from that time right up to the present, both parties have always accepted that the National Health Service is a permanent part of British life. But the difference between them was this. In general, Labour viewed the welfare state as part of a design to achieve overall equality, equality of condition among the citizens. The Conservatives, by contrast, even those who accepted the welfare state, regarded it as a safety net to prevent anyone from falling into absolute destitution. And their, their interest was in restoring incentives and opportunities. Whether to denationalise the major industries became a long-running source of dispute inside the Conservative Party. The Conservatives understood that denationalising the coal industry, for example, would effectively end it in many areas because it was no longer profitable. But ending it would in turn create universal unemployment in many coal mining towns. And the memory of the 1920s and 30s made many Conservatives dread high unemployment, which that would certainly entail. That memory, along with knowledge of the power of the coal miners trade unions, discouraged denationalisation. And in practice, the Conservatives, who were in power continuous, continuously for the next 13 years, between 1951 and 64, presided over a mixed economy and tried to keep their ideological concerns to a minimum, domesticating the nationalised industries but not reversing the process. What was left of the empire was clearly also in trouble. Anti-colonial uprisings in Kenya and Malaya were costly and difficult to suppress. Eventually, the British were able to put down rebellions in both places, but it was costly and difficult and it further prompted the possibility that Britain now had to abandon its imperial role completely. Churchill himself finally retired from the Premiership, aged 80, in 1955. He'd had a stroke in 1953, which had been uh, carefully concealed from the press and the public, something that's unimaginable today. And cabinet meetings, meanwhile, had become long, wandering monologues by Churchill, who'd always been garrulously talkative and now apparently uh, monopolised all the cabinet's time. So he celebrated his 80th birthday late in 1954 and then retired as Prime Minister early in the next year. His protégé and successor, Anthony Eden, miscalculated the American reaction to the Suez Adventure of 1956. 
and was also forced to resign. Now, the story of Anthony Eden is a bitter one. He'd been an opponent, opponent of appeasing Hitler in the late 1930s, just like Churchill. And as a politician in the 40s and 50s, that was the very best badge you could have, because the anti-appeasement people had been proved to be right. He was a loyal subordinate to Churchill for two decades, but he lacked Churchill's flair and ease of leadership. He wasn't the same kind of char charismatic man. Britain had been a principal owner of the Suez Canal ever since Disraeli bought the Khedive's shares back in the 1870s. But once India was independent, Britain began to reduce the strength of its garrisons along the routeways to India. Since Britain no longer had a, a compelling military motive to get to India regularly, the Mediterranean and the Red Sea and Suez itself seemed relatively less important. General Nasser, the Egyptian nationalist leader, reacted to this drawdown of military strength by nationalising the canal, seizing it unilaterally. Britain and France then conspired with Israel to recapture the canal, and they didn't first get the approval of the American leader, President Eisenhower. As a purely military venture, the invasion was a great success, but Eisenhower was furious that the British had launched this invasion, partly because he thought he ought to have been consulted as a member of NATO, and partly also because he was afraid that the invasion would provoke wider unrest in the Middle East. Eisenhower was chiefly interested in stabilising the Cold War and in getting as many third world client states as he could, particularly in the oil-rich Middle East. He realized that, uh, Eisenhower realised he couldn't afford to appear to be pro-imperialist to Middle Eastern states, so he threatened to withdraw American support for the pound sterling, in other words, to induce a financial crisis in Britain. That threat forced Anthony Eden, the British Prime Minister, to bring the, the venture to a halt, and then to undertake a, an ignominious withdrawal. Eden was sick, as well as being bitterly disappointed. The Conservative Party was in disarray about what to do next. And Eden himself resigned very shortly after Suez in January 1957. At this point, the Queen, advised by senior Conservative Lords, asked Harold Macmillan to take over. Harold Macmillan succeeded to the Premiership in 1957 and helped the Conservatives to repair the damage created by the Suez Crisis. Like Winston Churchill, Macmillan had a British father and an American mother. His father was the head of Macmillan Publishing, which is a, a, a company still thriving right up to the present. As with Churchill, it had seemed very unlikely that he would rise to party leadership. Once again, he'd been severely wounded in World War I in the trench fighting. He walked with a shuffle and he couldn't shake hands firmly. Severe disadvantages for a professional politician. But like Churchill and like Anthony Eden, he'd been an anti-appeaser in the 1930s. During the Great Depression, he'd been horrified by the high levels of unemployment and hopelessness in Britain and had written an influential book during the 1930s called The Middle Way accepting many of the ideas of John Maynard Keynes, the influential economist, particularly about the role of government in stimulating recovery from de uh, depression conditions. Macmillan had been regarded as a cranky left-of-centre conservative by the mainstream of the party. He'd also had a very unhappy personal life. He was looked down on by the conservative aristocrats because he came from a business family, and the aristocracy, even in the 20th century, regarded businessmen as distinctly beneath them. He married Dorothy Cavendish, the daughter of the Duke of Devonshire. And that ought to have helped a lot, giving him a, a leg up into arist aristocratic circles. But then she fell in love with Robert Boothby, one of Churchill's disreputable friends, another Conservative MP, apparently a man of immense personal charm, but also immense personal unscrupulousness. So Macmillan was a cuckold, unhappy in his personal life. His youngest daughter was almost certainly fathered by Boothby. Boothby, incidentally, was one of the people who came into office with Churchill that caused a lot of raised eyebrows among the Chamberlain loyalists in 1940. Still, Macmillan's great break came during the Second World War because he became a key figure in Anglo-American relations. He had the job of, of, co of, of establishing close links with the American Expeditionary Force in North Africa, and that meant that he got to know well and to work easily with Eisenhower. And of course, by the 1950s, Eisenhower had risen from the position of general to American president. So Macmillan was the perfect person to patch things up with the Americans after the Suez Crisis.
Macmillan presided over the final decolonisation of Africa by the British Empire. He made a famous speech to the South African Parliament in which he said, a wind of change is blowing through Africa. Britain, he said, would now help all its remaining colonies to achieve independence and become fledgling democracies. He won re-election in 1959 with the slogan, you've never had it so good. By then, Britain's um, post-war austerities were finally lifting, and Britain also was beginning to join in the great consumer and economic boom of the post-war Western democracies. And Butler's remark in 1947 was proving true. The Conservatives could appeal against the memory of socialist austerity in the late 40s, now that standards of living were rising. This was the third Conservative victory in succession. But Macmillan's hopes of taking Britain into the common market, what's now called the European Union, failed. The great question that the Conservatives had to ask, or that everyone in Britain had to ask after 1950 was, where does our future lie? Does it lie with the Empire? By 1960 the answer was clearly no. Does it lie with the special Anglo-American relationship? Macmillan hoped that the answer to that one was yes. He liked the idea of playing elder statesman to the young American president, John F. Kennedy. Although, when it came to the point, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, Kennedy didn't even consult him. Those were two choices. The third choice was that Britain's destiny now lay with a united Europe. Macmillan believed that it should. The European coal and steel community had begun in the early 1950s, when the Marshall Plan was beginning to work, to aid recovery of all the industrial democracies and to reduce the danger that the European nations would ever again fight against each other. Macmillan wanted to take Britain into the Union, but General de Gaulle, the French leader, vetoed British entry. He remembered with deep resentment his treatment by Britain as leader of the Free French Forces in World War II, and he was determined not to submit to Anglo-Saxon domination. Well, the Profumo affair of 1963 and an election loss to Labour in 1964, along with the death of Churchill in 1965, cast heavy shadows over Conservatives' prospects. First of all, the Profumo affair. He was a junior minister in the Conservative War Office who was revealed to have had an affair with a call girl named Christine Keeler. But at the same time, it was disclosed that she was also sleeping with a Russian military attaché, a terrible potential security breach. The investigation in the Profumo affair showed no military secrets had been lost, but the moral taint on the Conservative government was very severe indeed. Macmillan retired in 1963 and was replaced as Conservative leader by Alec Douglas Hume. Now that was a surprising choice because Hume was in the House, sitting in the House of Lords. But by the 1960s there was a renewed questioning of the role of the hereditary peerage in the House of Lords, which is an issue we've seen periodically through the course. One Labour politician, Anthony Wedgwood Benn, who belonged to the radical left, didn't want to become a Lord, and he introduced legislation into Parliament to make the inheritance of titles voluntary rather than compulsory. His father was the Viscount Stansgate, and he would have become the second Viscount, but he didn't want to. He didn't believe in aristocracy, and he wanted to stay in the Commons. The legislation passed, so he renounced his title. And so did Lord Hailsham, who also hoped to become the new Conservative leader. And so did Alec Douglas Hume took advantage of it and renounced his title so that he could return to the House of Commons and become Conservative leader and Prime Minister. He had been the 14th Earl Hume. When the Labour Party leader Harold Wilson jibed that Tory progress had come to a halt with the selection as leader of the 14th Earl Hume, Hume answered that his opponent was the 14th Mr Wilson. But the very fact he had to make a joke of this kind showed that by now uh, a noble title was a positive liability where two centuries earlier it would have been an overwhelming advantage. In any case, he was a lacklustre leader and lost the election of 1964. Churchill's death in 1965 prompted a wave of national and international tributes, but could not disguise the fact that the Conservative Party was in disarray. Churchill himself hadn't been Conservative Prime Minister until the age of 76, he hadn't been a Conservative for much of his active political life, and he hadn't been the favourite son of the mainstream of the party through the 1930s. Nevertheless, he is in retrospect the greatest British Conservative of the 20th century.